Chapter 4 of A Diamond in the Rough by a Self-Made Man. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 The Ambush That Didn't Work and What Came of It When Fred King reached his lodgings that evening, he found a note from one of his old slate-picker friends who had got a job in Wilkes-Barre, asking him to come and see him that night if possible. The boy considered the question while eating his supper and finally decided to go. As he passed by the miners' retreat, he observed Moses Wise and a pal hanging around on the outside of the dram shop. The bully saw him and scowled darkly. Just then an acquaintance of Fred's came along and asked him where he was going. "'To Wilkes-Barre,' he replied. "'It'll be late before you get back, won't it?' said his friend. Well, "'I guess it will,' admitted King, and with that they parted. Moses, however, had heard the brief conversation." It was close to one o'clock in the morning when Fred came through the wood on the outskirts of the mining village. He was whistling merrily to beguile the lonesomeness of his walk. It was not a very bright night, as there was no moon, and the wind soughed through the leaves and branches. A timid person wouldn't have relished his surroundings, but Fred was built of sterner stuff, and he plodded along as unconcerned as though he was on a crowded city thoroughfare. Suddenly something whizzed through the air and whisked his hat from his head as neatly as if it sliced off with a knife. "'What's that?' cried the boy, stopping in his tracks and looking after his hat, which had rolled against the hedge. "'Whizz!' A big chunk of coal almost brushed the boy's nose. Fred started back, thoroughly startled at the vigor of the onslaught made upon him. A third missile passed a foot above his head and went to pieces with a bang against the fence. It was certainly too serious to be pleasant for the victim of this fusillade. Fred picked up his hat and, crouching in the shadow of the hedge, ran forward. Then the bombardment ceased, for the object of the attack had disappeared. King didn't go very far, but hid himself, awaiting further developments. Presently he heard a rustling along the further hedge, and then a dark patch came into indistinct view beside the opposite fence, and this was almost immediately joined by another. Then he heard voices in conversation. Presently two forms vaulted over the fence and came out into the middle of the road. "'Where'd he go?' said a voice which Fred was willing to swear belonged to Mickey Gibbs, a pal of Moses Wise. "'No, no,' replied his companion, who Fred was sure must be Moses himself, as well as he could make out in the gloom. "'The rascals,' muttered the concealed boy. "'It's like the cowards they are to get me in such an underhanded way.' They must have learned that I went to Wilkes-Barre, and they've been waiting here to ambush me on the way back. I'd like to pickle em for it. He disappeared all of a sudden, went on Mickey Gibbs, just as if he dropped into the ground. Maybe he's hiding along the hedge. Let's beat the bushes and see, suggested Moses. If we catch him, we'll lay it on him good and thick. I don't care if we half kill him. The two young rascals had come prepared for business, for Mickey had a stout cudgel and Moses a wicked-looking whip. Fred King heard every word they said, and their cowardly project made him mad. The miserable skunks, he murmured. They were going to knock me silly with the clunks of coal first, and then finish me with a club and whip. I'll just give them a bit of surprise on my own hook and see how they like it. Moses and Mickey were gradually approaching the spot where he was hidden, beating the hedge and bushes as they came. Mickey was several paces in advance of his companion, and of course reached Fred first. With a wild Comanche yell, King rose up suddenly right under Mickey's nose. Young Gibbs was so startled that he let out a similar kind of yell and started to run. Fred reached for him, snatched the stick out of his hand, and gave him a good crack over the head, stretching the Irish boy half-stunned on the road. Moses was at first startled too, but recovered himself in time to realize what had occurred, and he whistled the whiplash about Fred's ears, raising a livid wail upon one of his cheeks. King was thoroughly indignant before, but he was mad clear through now. A second stroke fell upon his back and shoulders with vicious force, and Moses had drawn back his arm to inflict a third stroke when Fred closed on him in a rush. "'You cur!' he cried furiously. "'I'll have no mercy on you now!' Whack! Moses got it square in the eye, and then the whip was snatched from his grasp. "'Take that! And that! And that!' Fred had Moses by the collar of his jacket and was raining blow after blow upon his body and legs. Hoop! Hoop! cried Moses, as each stroke cut his flesh like the stings of a hundred scorpions. Mickey, help me! Knock him down! He's killing me! Uh, there was no help for Moses, for Mickey Gibbs was out of it. Swish! 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 Whoa! Whoa! 
Whoa! screamed Moses, struggling to avoid a terrible punishment he was receiving. You miserable coward! You sneak in the dark! cried Fred, continuing to lay the whip on his enemy without the least intermission. Don't! Don't! Please don't! You're killing me! screamed Moses in agony of pain. Would you have had any mercy on me, you whelp? I believe you two meant to lay me out for keeps tonight. Supposing either of those hunks of coal hit me in the head as you intended they should, where would I have been? You might have killed me tonight down by the river with that piece of slate if your aim had been truer. And this is what I get for saving a miserable hound like you from getting chewed up by Anderson's bulldog. Swish, swish, swish. Oh, 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 howled Moses, dropping onto his knees. I'll never touch you again, I swear it. Please stop. Oh, oh. The cowardly wretch who had provided the instrument of his own punishment shrieked and yelled and whined for mercy. But for once, a usually generous-hearted boy was implacable. All the anger and indignation of his nature was aroused by this treacherous attack in the dark, and from which he had escaped by only a miracle. He believed his two enemies would have fairly flayed him alive once they got him into their power, and this feeling left no pity in his heart for either of them. Though Moses cringed and shrieked at his feet, he continued to whip him with an unsparing hand. The young villain had never received such a punishment in his life, even from his father, who had very little mercy on him when chastising him. Suddenly Moses ceased his heart-rending cries, and his head fell over on his shoulder. He hung limp and lifeless in Fred's grasp. He had fainted under the severity of the drubbing inflicted on him. This fact brought King to his senses, and to the sober realization that he had gone too far. He let go of Moses, and the young wise fell in a heap in the road. Fred bent over him with sudden anxiety. The young ruffian's white face seemed to reproach him for his fit of ungovernable anger. Great Scott! I hope I haven't killed him! The boy's voice died away in a horrified whisper. He tore open Moses' shirt front and put his ear to his heart. He's breathing all right, he muttered with a sigh of relief. I guess he's only fainted. I must have licked him more than I intended. But he deserved every blow he got. Why can't he leave me alone? Then he noticed Mickey rising to his feet a yard or two away. He, too, looked like a mighty sick boy. He had a lump the size of half a hen's egg on the side of his head, where Fred had hit him with his own cudgel. Come here, Gibbs, Fred called peremptorily. The boy stared at him, but seemed rather disposed to take to his heels. Come here, I'm not going to hit you again. You want to look after Moses and see if he gets home. Mickey came up slowly and looked down at his associate. Is he dead? he asked in a scared voice. No, only fainted. You must have given him off a licking. I'm more than what was coming to him, answered Fred, starting to walk off. At that moment, a bright light suddenly lit up the nearby landscape. Great horn spoon, cried Fred as a glare of flames sifted through the trees. That must be a house afire. He started for the opening in the wood on a dead run. End of chapter 4